Hi, Matt. Thank you for joining us on Black Ink Cinema Podcast. Hello. Thanks for having me. An absolute pleasure. So before we get into your wonderful choice of mm-hmm. film that you chose, you are a doctor slash musician as well. Yeah, I mean, musicians probably stretching it a little bit. Certainly, like, so I'm definitely a doctor, and um, I used to DJ quite a lot. Um, if you put an, if you put an instrument in front of me, I will embarrass myself <laughs> and be asked to leave quite quickly. Okay, what kind of music do you DJ? Um, I mean, it changed quite a lot while I was growing up because I had a really like. I, so this sounds cool until you realise like the lamest entry point into DJing was my parents. Lovely, um, yeah. On a car, cool. on a car journey, and again, this is also the worst <laughs> lamest entrance into liking hip hop. But my parents <laughs> were listening to a Malcolm McLaren uh, sort of hit story of him and his involvement with hip hop, and then they right. had quite a long session of him talking about scratching and then lots of scratching on the thing. I was like, just my mind was blown and so then I was like begging them could you please get me a set of turntables and I don't yeah. know how I did it but they they did buy me turntables oh, when I was about 12. Luxury uh, just to make more noise in your room. Yeah of course as long as I kept the headphones on they Great were okay parents. with that so yeah so I used to play quite a lot of hip-hop then when my friends started going out going to a bit more sort of electronic music dance music so used to, we used to go to fabric quite a lot so yeah. basically whatever they were playing in fabric was whatever I then uh. <laughs> when I was a teenager. Cool. And also you're a doctor, which I'm sure in these um, very hard dire times has come extremely handy as a fallback career. Yeah, I mean, ex- exactly. Not the things to say in, at the peak of a crisis. Like, I'm mainly yeah. just in it for the, uh, just to pay with the rent. But, um, <laughs> certainly, um, I mean, COVID's been tough for everyone. Mm-hmm. And I think strangely, as much as doing, um, you know, working in COVID has been a bit of a struggle mm-hmm. compared to people who have all been cooped up and had a lot of uncertainty about their future. It's been a weird almost safe haven to have the normality of being able to go to work. And then the second sort of strand to that is now that comedy doesn't really happen reliably or frequently enough, then it's, as you say, a good fallback. It's an amazing fallback. It's uh, it's like you knew. (laughs) You just had Exactly. I did used to, so I used to open with a joke about how doctors, you know, you think we're nice people, but actually we we thrive on other people's crises. So when you're having a, when you're having a bad day, you know, that's, that's our job guaranteed for a while longer. (laughs) So obviously this time's been quite intense for you. Have you found the balance? I think, well, the fact that there aren't any gigs to take away my concentration has probably Mm. made it a bit easier. I mean, the first wave was probably a bit more intense because I was doing COVID at that point. Mm. So far, I haven't been redeployed back to doing COVID. Uh, Yeah, well, that's what they call it. It's redeployment. So, you know, everyone's, everyone likes adopting war terminology as soon (laughs) as, you know, you know, everyone gets to play like it's, uh, you know, uh, a military crisis. But so I haven't been redeployed this time. Mm. So strangely, my job is almost less intense in that it's now like I work in a call center. So a lot of our clinics, I've just got a headset on and it's like, hi, how are you doing? Good. Oh my gosh. Um, So how did your parents find it when you told them you wanted to get into comedy? Because I'm sure like when you were like doctor, they were like, yes, we've hit the jackpot here. And then you're like, actually, I would like to go into another route. Uh, I mean, I guess they were cool with it because I, I, I suppose as demonstrated by the fact that they bought me a pair of turntables when I was a teenager, they've always been a lot, you know, as long as you keep your grades up and do the yeah. thing that's going to mean you're not, you know, destitute, you can do whatever else you want. So my parents love that I do comedy. That mm-hmm. like my parents, have seen, my parents have come to so many of my gigs that oh, cool. you're like, you've seen all of this material. Why are you here? Oh, they're here to support. Yeah. Exactly. That's I know, but I'm just great. surprised. I know it's <laughs> nice. I love that. I love that they come, but even I'd be like, I wouldn't come to see this <laughs> oh, as much as, you know, if my child. That. Yeah. We need to promote you. Don't say yeah. that. No, no. I mean, just in terms of the repetition, like, you know, if they've seen the same competition set at, every single point in the competition it's like you guys oh the other thing as well is my dad for like so particularly when you're starting out in comedy you have quite you know a repetitive few little jokes that you do in every competition yeah. my dad is 50 percent of my competition set, or he was <laughs> when just talking to people about my dad was a large part of my material how does he find that is he is it he likes it. he's used to it i mean he's grown up like being more popular than me amongst my friends at every step of the uh, oh. Um, cause I mean, my dad is, so he's, my dad's Jamaican, uh, mm. but for sort of complicated reasons has a very posh, posh, posh accent. Like my dad is like Jeffrey from the Fresh Prince. Oh wow. Um, Super posh. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, just in terms of his voice, uh, mm. but, and his name's Winston as well. So you That's can imagine. That's a Jamaican name though. I feel yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. So he's the only one in his family who's got that posh accent, uh, but 
so obviously growing up, particularly because I went to, you know, shock horror at quite a white school. Mm-hmm. So then uh, the, this <laughs> Winston was, uh, should we say, famous. <laughs> I can imagine. Friends. Yeah. Yeah. It was like this probably enigma. Of yeah, exactly. Religious. Ask all those questions I wanted to ask a black person for a while. Oh, um, basically, that was yeah, that was yeah. going. At, and that will be, we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk about that when we come onto my film <laughs> choice as well. Exactly, you know, it's all going to become abundantly clear why I chose. Yeah, the I was, was going to get into that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're here to celebrate black cinema, and you chose mm-hmm. one of my faves, Jordan Peele's Get Out, with my UG brother Daniel Kaluuya. Yeah. Um, aside from the obvious of it being an absolute masterpiece, um, I love the plot. I love the mixture of humour and horror, which is well executed. Why did you choose Get Out? Yeah, well, I first start by agreeing complete with you. Like, I don't think I appreciated how much of a base it is. A masterpiece it's, of a yeah. film. Like, mm-hmm. I think the first time I watched it, I was just like, "Cool, this is like what the hype is about." And then you go back and watch it and go, "How did they do this?" you know, in terms of pacing, everything yeah. like, cause it's like really like classic horror film style. Mm. Like, I mean, are we allowed spoilers by the way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, if they haven't watched it by now, this yeah, is... Yeah, they, they need to get to know. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. I mean, like the fact that no one dies for most of the film, like that is yeah. not something you get away with in horror, like modern horror film. Yeah. I think that's why when people do die, it's really, it's a climax. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because they've Completely. like caught up to it. Yeah. And there's like you say, the balance of comedy, like it's got comedy in it without that ever detracting from the tension and the sort of horror aspect of it. It's great. Yeah. Um, and there was aspects where I thought I shouldn't be laughing at this, but this is hilarious, which is yeah. even more funny because it's like. Completely. Like, and I wouldn't claim to know, you know, I'm not a film buff by any stretch of the imagination. Like I've got a very poor attention <laughs> span these days but definitely as far as from what I know about films like it's I can't fault it at all so but then in terms of why I chose it specifically because I'll confess when I was you know first asked about this uh, podcast particularly as a lot of the go-tos had already been chosen by other people okay like I'm if someone, this one hadn't been chosen yeah no exactly I was just like hold on no one's t- Oh, thank God. Like, you know, <laughs> it's one of you know the one because there's loads of films that I like but either someone had already talked about them mm. or at the same time, you might not have as much to say about them or as well, because I don't know, it comes up, but a lot of, you know, films that I would describe as black films, a lot of them just talking about them just depressed me, the subject matter that was mm-hmm. being, de- like, you know. A trauma. Yeah, exactly. It's like, I don't really want to talk, like Boys in the Hood, like I could have talked about that, but I'd have just yeah. felt miserable. Like I sort of, you know, <laughs> you know, like the sort of image of Ricky getting shot burned into my. I've got that as well. It's exactly. like, the only time I think of that film is just that, like particular scene yeah and you're just thinking like watching them sort of run over those uh you know when they're running across the fence it's like yeah. it just jumped into a different thing or like <laughs> said i wasn't going to bring up the trauma and then just blurt their trauma out again it. so obviously that's failed but um <laughs> the reason i talked about this is i think the short answer is it's very relevant to my life like a large part of my life is <laughs> essentially the non-murdery bits of get out i was about to say i'm very worried <laughs> yeah. yeah don't worry I, I haven't i haven't done the uh you know if we chopped off like the last 40 minutes or so of the film anyway yeah um because i think obviously it's you know can end up sort of saying it's quite difficult to express some of these things but if you're particularly doing my job and mm-hmm. then at various other stages of my life you yes. find yourself in quite white spaces mm-hmm a huge amount of the time and that is probably for multiple quite complicated reasons but it's almost like those situations beget further situations that place you in those situations to the point where particularly if you're in medicine like and particularly for doing academic medicine you're surrounded by white people all Mm. the time yeah um, and obviously I should point out, you know, obviously this time second generation in this because my dad uh, is married, you know, my mum's white. Yes. Uh, so obviously that's further complicates that. I was going to say, have they watched this movie? Um, I think they have because it's on the Amazon that I don't share with them, but definitely <laughs> share with them. <laughs> Family members, as soon as they get a hold of your account, no, exactly. hold, everyone's logging in. So yeah. Yeah. But I mean, but we haven't talked about it at length. Um but I think it's, you know, when you watch this film and look at how much obviously it's focused on black people, particularly, you know, obviously the US and mm. how they interact with white culture and predominantly white spaces, it's no surprise Jordan appeals, you know, mother is white as well, as yeah. far as I understand it. So he's obviously um, mixed race or dual heritage. Well. Yeah, exactly. So he's, mm. I think, in the same situation where I am, where you kind of grow up in a strange situation where you are attuned to that because your very being is a product of that interaction. Yeah. 
and as you are biracial, you're exposed mm-hmm. to both sides. Yeah, completely. Uh, and completely see it from a unique perspective because mm-hmm. obviously as a black woman, I see it from like I can understand, but I won't mm-hmm. fully understand how you your perspective would be. In yeah, completely. And so, I th- yeah, I think you find yourself in the position as well where you may at the same time be slightly perceived as alien in both environments as well Mm -hmm. but the payoff for that is kind of having an understanding of both concurrently yeah the intro was quite interesting and i felt set the scene and the pace for the rest of the movie with the the music run rabbit which is a Mm. typical hunting song yeah um which is crazy and the suspense and then like we said like no one really dies apart from that intro scene we don't know if he's dead or not we can't no, exactly yeah so you get that sort of thing set up but even then you but yeah. i think but i feel like at that point you can almost still tell that he's been abducted rather than, yeah because you know there's something else going on you can definitely see because it's you know he's put him to sleep and then dragged off rather than... yeah exactly and even just having a white cart there was just so many like subliminals in mm-hmm. like the first five minutes uh that you mm-hmm. kind of pick up which leads on to the the other type of music the childish mm-hmm. gambino's red bone song which is yeah. talking about stay woke, stay woke yeah. and then the swahili song as well which is talking about um run run away kind mm-hmm. of warning uh chris but at that point i don't speak swahili i don't know no. This exactly, is- <laughs> yeah. It's just all these levels when you just go, oh, he's even, he's even, thought, he's even thought about the layers <laughs> in the soundtrack. Obviously, of course yeah. he has. But going back to what you're saying as well about, um, you know, him in where it opens, mm. sort of showing early on that white suburbia is not a safe place yeah. for these people that it would be perceived as for other people potentially. So the mm. fact that he's not safe in this nice sort of supposedly nice picket fenced mm. yeah. street uh, I think again says quite a lot about what the film's trying to potentially say. Yeah, and I love how the key Stanfield only had like a small bit in that film, but it's mm-hmm. probably one of the most iconic moments. You know, when his like nose is bleeding and stuff, and he really mm-hmm. stands out. I'll probably put him on the map for the rest of us to kind of see. Um, it's a big, big fan of him. Oh, I'm a massive fan of him until you Google him and realise he's 29. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's been in like, the game for a minute. He's just like, I've- <laughs> it makes me feel like, you know, I'm, st- I'm still, regardless of anything I may have done in my life, I'm still not sort of successful enough not to be bitter when I see someone 29 years old. Oh, you achieved. know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's achieved what he I mean, you know, you're a and, doctor. I feel like don't, don't put yourself down. Come on. Like, that's yeah, I'm, I'm over the hill now. I'm 30. I'm 30. I'm, I shouldn't say how old I am, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm over 30. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just no. saying we're over 30 at this point. Exactly, you don't even, yeah. you don't give the actual number. No, no, he's great. And as well, the, the worst thing as well about this, again, I shouldn't admit this, is that, you know, when Lakeith's, when I mean, you see him later on wearing yes. that, like, it's like, you know, it's like, I would wear that outfit. <laughs> <laughs> Again. I love that. I feel like there was a few people that were like, "Hmm, that's exactly yeah, he's, what even we're... even as a sort of brainwashed." Uh, <laughs> and what in regards to what message he's trying to say, it's just like I am considering wearing a straw boater at the next <laughs> social engagement I go to, if that's my sellout credentials. Um, <laughs> the thing is, I think that oh was God. just an extreme stereotype of like what a to show the you know the difference between his real self and. Mm this kind of yeah of course yeah, yeah. Uh, I, which was I quite funny slightly. because we could all recognize that and was like that's not him you know which is quite hilarious in itself so jordan pill does this like he kind of talks about race in a very sensitive way but is able you're able to digest it i never felt like it was like pushed down your throat it was very cleverly done and oh. made the audience walk away like questioning themselves like mm-hmm. i don't know if you had anyone Maybe your white family members or friends ever come up to you and say like, oh my God, I didn't, watching that made me check myself and like apologize for certain things that they'd said or behaviors. Like when white people come to spud me instead of shaking my hand. Mm. Like, like Oh, completely. Behavior. And I mean, I think this, so weirdly, I'll say weirdly, like I don't actually have any white family members. So like my mum's an only child. And oh, okay. then, so both my grandparents aren't uh, with us anymore on that side of the family. So um, I don't, that doesn't actually necessarily happen a huge <laughs> amount. But then again, having said that, um, <laughs> Obviously, with work and going to this kind of school that I went to, obviously a lot of, I say a lot of it, obviously, but a lot of my friends are white. I don't think necessarily we discussed this film in Mm. much detail, but even me, it made me question certain things as well. Mm -hmm. Because I think it would be convenient to put yourself in a position where you go, well, none of the uh, negative things that are conveyed in this film, I could be even remotely guilty of. Uh, Yeah, put yourself apart from potentially being part of whatever problem or at least discussion is being had yeah. in the film as well. So I think more in terms of introspectively mm-hmm. is what I think this film has made me look. 
yeah. and question certain things, I would say. That's, that's very interesting. It's funny because it would have been easier for them to make the family quite hillbilly and racist mm. and KKK. And so it's like very clear, these are bad people, you know, they're racist. But if anything, it feels like a backhanded compliment. It's almost like black people don't understand the quality that you have. So we're going to inhabit your shells mm. um, and execute it a little bit better. And yeah. put it to good use. That's how it kind of felt to me. So, and using them as vehicles, essentially. Yes. like yes. As in literally making them into objects in the film. Yeah. Um, and I think there's obviously the, well, I keep saying obviously, but the bits about the other guy wanting his eye and trying to take yes. you know, the culture that he's producing, I think is a fairly, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to claim to be a genius at looking for subtext, but even I think it's clearly he's yeah. wanting to take his artwork without any kind of credit or mm. true understanding of who he is as a person. I mean, at that point, that's the blind guy's the only person that kind of says, like, I don't really care about race. I just want mm-hmm. eyes. Um, mm-hmm. But everyone else, you know, the touching of the arms, like he doesn't mm-hmm. realise Chris at that moment is being shocked for that when people yeah. come up to him and having these like r- really random conversations, which I genuinely have had with people, like people just bring up mm-hmm. hip hop or like, I don't know, whatever's going on in the news, if it's like something to do with a black person, it's like, what I don't only talk things black like we can talk about other generic things i think in that situation as well it's very really really tricky because i don't want to sound like i'm sort of excusing that sort of behavior Mm -hmm. but at the same time you do sometimes feel like like i get it you have no idea what to say necessarily and i mean again i think it might depend where you are and in what situations because it doesn't happen to me quite as much as it might do to certain other people Mm. other situation where you kind of end up in that is where people will nudge you towards the only other black person in a situation and be like, yeah. hey, you've got to meet, you got to meet Dave. He's... <laughs> do you not know? Do you not do know? You exactly. Know? <laughs> How do you not know? You live by Flipper South London. How do you not know? No, exactly. I mean, you, you were not at the last meeting. You're on, <laughs> you're on different shifts. Yeah, you must know. Um, also, what I loved when I was doing some research into this is, although Jordan Peele talks about this is made up and he draws the story from some facts, the amount of people, black people, black men that go missing. And the ratio is quite scary. How was he even allowed to tell this story? I was quite shocked Mm. that Hollywood even allowed him to tell. The reason he's allowed to tell it is the budget's so low. Mm, mm, Yeah. Like the budget's 4 million or something, or 4.5 million. Crazy. Yeah. When, and it made obviously, you know, the ratio is amazing because it made like 230 or so. So that's how (laughs) it's still, you know. Because yeah, exactly. it's great. black doesn't can't... sell and no. that really proved, you know, on the lowest yeah. budget and he was still able to execute something like that. So I think that's finally becoming apparent to people, <laughs> which is... Uh... But I hate the fact we have to keep proving that. Mm. Uh, that's a bit frustrating. Yeah, well, because you talked about Tyler Perry in mm. uh, when you were talking, was it in the one you were doing with Slim? Yes. In terms of people <laughs> who just demonstrate, yeah, I've made enough money doing this to make my own studio, so probably it's worth coming around for your own financial sakes, if <laughs> not through any sense of integrity or wish to support. You could just be making I mean, some money with us. Yeah, exactly. And I think even things like Black Panther probably demonstrated mm-hmm. that as well, where it's just like, I mean, regardless of how much you do or don't care, just just look at the receipts. Yeah, so many themes to pick from slavery, missing persons, interracial relationships. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, have you experienced anything? I don't want to say anything like that because it's not. No, no, but I think I definitely, but, no, I definitely have in the sense. So yeah. the question, um, because I think, I think a useful term um, is like, you know, when Akala talks about natives um, mm, racialized, like racialized as black is a very useful phrase. In the sense, obviously, I'm mm-hmm. definitely clearly mixed race or dual heritage, yeah. whatever, the, whatever the kind, you know. What but the in, term is now. Yeah, because that's <laughs> another thing I guess you end up having to contend with is like, so when I was a kid, mixed race was just the word. Mm-hmm. And then now that's not necessarily the correct word, but it's like having to just double check what the correct way to refer to yourself is every <laughs> few years sporadically is an unusual uh, situation to be in but for the purpose of this podcast i'm going to say mixed race um but so obviously despite being mixed race the word you know racialized or the term racialized as black i think is useful because when you're going to meet someone's parents you yeah. are the black guy they're bringing home <clears throat> mm-hmm. you know for one of the you know better and have you expression. said have you told them have you told them i'm black have you i'm ever- sure i've had that conversation before but you know when it becomes such a normal thing or you kind of assume and you sort of 
<laughs> try and gauge not even through overt conversation but yeah. like so, so oh, have they seen a picture of me <laughs> <laughs> they're active they're active on facebook you know there's a picture of us last week do, uh, in that do tag me in that one yeah, exactly so i mean i think you can i think you can often tell because obviously they asked it for the sake of dialogue in a in mm. a film but often you can tell more subtly or in a nuanced way that they have or haven't discussed you etc that sort of thing yeah um, so certainly I've had that situation and often an experience I've had more broadly as well as particularly if you're going to meet someone at university because right. you know you, where do you meet the people you go out with it's work school uni wherever you are at the same time mm-hmm. so I went to uni in London so when you're dating someone um, in London you're just part of normal cosmopolitan yeah. London but you know shock horror everyone that goes to UCL or a good number of people they come from the home counties yes yeah. So when you go home to meet their parents, uh, then you're, that was <laughs> speak. <laughs> um, now if almost on cue, that would be speak of the devil. Uh, <laughs> my girlfriend <laughs> just uh, tried, wandered in. Um, oh God. But, and so, you know, you're often going to the home counties to meet mum and dad. Um, and then there's that situation where you suddenly go from being, in cosmopolitan London to them sticking out like a sore thumb when you go yeah. out to those places. Yeah. Um, so that was my experience certainly of uh-huh. that type of conversation. Obviously it talks about trauma. Um, and I think interestingly, the way they talk about abandonment and um, he kind of draws some sort of parallel between the deer, his mum's death, and then the deer in front of him kind of watching him die. Like it's very clever how they managed to kind of sew all these different moments of the film together. And like, like you, when I watched it the first time, I was just like consuming the film. But then when mm. I watched it like a few more times, I was like, Oh my God, that's so clever. And it's just like, so, so what did you take the deer to mean in that respect? Like, as in who did you think the deer was? <laughs> so initially, obviously we don't know, but as the film continues and then he talks about how his mum was um, a hit and run victim mm-hmm. and how she was left to kind of die in the street and if he had called police or whatever like then maybe mm-hmm. she would have survived and stuff and that kind of kind of needing to save the deer and feeling sorry for the deer mm-hmm. and then also when he's like strapped up in the chair and then the deer's now watching him yeah like, meet his ultimate you know demise. So like yeah if you could have saved me then maybe you wouldn't be in this mess yeah and then the deer, he uses the deer's head to kill the dad it's yeah Quite yeah, deep. I thought that was quite masculine you know, about sort of almost masculinity as well. It's like you've shot this deer, killed it with its ant- you know, antlers, but it's getting its revenge in that respect. Yeah. And his sort of hubris and masculinity sort yeah. of attempt has ended up with him getting impaled by this stag mm. that he's mounted on the wall. <laughs> How did you think Daniel Clue's performance and and the rest of the cast was? Because for me, it was like the first his first leading role. I'd seen him in a few other things. Johnny English when he played. I don't know if you've seen Johnny English no, in I've- that. <laughs> I just he'll always be the he'll always be Kenneth from Skins. Yeah, see, the thing is, I, mean, I think I must have stopped watching Skins at that point, um, which is quite funny. So it was kind of I watched it backwards when I was like, oh, he was in Skins, and then. But even in that character in Skins, so mm-hmm. I mean, not that he'll always be that's came out wrong. Not that he'll always be Kenneth in Skins. Obviously, he's gone no, on to do that's... fantastic things, and he's obviously <laughs> you know fantastic and brilliant. But in my you know, obviously that's Skins came out at the time I was you know that yeah. was my TV show. Um, yeah. And but even in that he played a character who was sort of code switching and mm. torn between two worlds because his real I think his character's name was Posh Kenneth. <laughs> I think um, so. Yeah. And in that he's often sort of speaking really posh one second, and mm. then because he is the black guy in a group of white people, it's mm. kind of almost expected of him to suddenly start talking, you know, in a more I guess stereotypically street way. Mm-hmm. Um, so that really stuck in my mind, even watching that at the time. So I thought mm. it was quite a it's something I hadn't seen portrayed even at the time. Yeah, it was quite new, and I think now we have those conversations about code mm. switching and how important it is, and mm-hmm. how important it is to survive. <laughs> more importantly, um, so it's quite mm. nice to to see that be portrayed. Yeah, and also complete. The other thing about that type of code switching, because it wasn't even just him speaking in a particular way; it was almost him pretending to be something he's not mm. i.e so he's posh but then trying to act aggressive and I don't want to, it's quite a different way to express this but as about you know sounding more street it's almost mm. he's got a pressure i guess adhere to that aesthetic as yeah. well um despite not you know he can't really admit to who or what he is but i think 
he'll always feel like the outsider in that circle anyway, mm-hmm. um, because you just stand out. It's like, yeah, like for myself, I don't quite hear how, I don't know how other I am until I'm in mm-hmm. a set space. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, do you find your accent changes quite a lot as in even non-consciously? I think I, it's funny. I hear my accent or I hear my voice. Whereas in my natural settings, I don't know, around family or people I've kind of grown up with, I don't hear my sound, like myself, until I'm in like a white space and I'm like, fucking hell, you sound so like East London mm, or yeah. like so Essex. And I'm like, ah! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, sort of don't. <laughs> Because I think I certainly definitely growing up had the situation where I went to school in Kent uh, because my parents were like, again, just again, this is terrible because it's like, you know, obviously what is it saying about your faith and your ability to sort of stay within your community and thrive Mm -hmm. there? But they were like, you're not going to school in Lewisham for secondary school. Uh, Yeah. Just purely, well, yeah, they just look at the grades and you just ultimately go, regardless of whether this is or isn't selling out, they're like, you know, this school has twice the you know, grades of the local school. So you're going to take a test and go there. Yeah. Um, but I went to school in, uh, or in Kent um, at the peak of Danny Dyer being a heartthrob. So everyone in my school just, well, you know, like you know, Danny Dyer did a lot of things for sort of average looking guys and their confidence. <laughs> I'm here for Football Factory. and Yeah, exactly. Uh, that was, like, yeah. I'm here for it. For, uh, heartthrob, I, okay. I mean, trust me, well, you know, regardless of whatever we want to call it, but Football <laughs> Factory in particular did a lot yeah. for guys, average looking guys with a bit of confidence in Big my confidence. area in sort yeah. of Kent or uh, Bromley area. And mm-hmm. so everyone in my school just wanted to be Mockney. <laughs> so that was the strongest accent I think I've ever had was getting almost pulled into that sound oh, okay. rather than yeah uh, and so then when you listen to me I'd say as a teenager compared to now yeah it's just like my friends from there it's like what's happened to your voice who are you right yeah now? why do you sound <laughs> like well you're, you're a doctor so you can't yeah. exactly uh you know I'm sure you can dip into it in and out when you when you, you can't but it becomes your default accent definitely like the work doctor accent is now just how I sound yeah and my friends are just like what yeah because that's your that's probably you know the voice that you use all the time and yeah. so you know that's gonna stick also throughout the film they have little hints of where it's kind of going um the initial conversation that uh, Chris has with Bradley about um Jesse Owens about his parents about mm. um if I could vote for Obama a third time <laughs> I would have it's just something that was like so small but like it adds to the whole storyline of the film and adds to the layers of the nuance of little things that people say that is just like so unnecessary for me yeah. it's like it's okay you don't need to overprove that you're not racist by saying if I could I would vote for Obama the third time and yeah. in fact when people do that I often think yeah, yeah why are you, why is this such why, a why major are you explaining yourself to me I don't even know who you are yeah, I mean, it's really similar to, and both are obviously fantastic, but you know, the Juneteenth party in Atlanta. Yes. Like uh, the, uh, I can't remember her name, but um, in the episode where Ern gets dragged to that party and there's um, a black woman who's married to sort of an aggressively woke white guy. Yes, yes. yes. And, uh, the, again, that sort of same thing of the sort of kind of go, so yeah, yeah, what sports do you play? It's like, oh. yeah. <laughs> God, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And this like, is I can't rap and I can't sing. So exactly. Well, I'm you know. So again, it's like, I mean, a lot of this is going to be regurgitated material. But um, I talk about this on stage. But being well, it's the blackest person in you know a very white school for a period. <laughs> um, like you know, you come with a lot of pressure. It's like right, this is the new the new the new recruit from Catford. Uh, the football, <laughs> you know, the the, the the football team just rubbing their hands. <laughs> they're like he's going to be so sick yeah. and I am not that guy like I am bad at football they're like why aren't you like Ian Wright like aren't you no, exactly. Like, yeah, what? No. <laughs> what happened to you <laughs> yeah God, who knows oh, that makes me laugh so much because the amount of times I got that wrong it's uh, I can't show you the latest dance move I didn't pay no. it no yeah, I mean I do DJ if that's enough that's the that's you know, the, you know I can I can liven up the Christmas party <laughs> it's probably the that's extent of hard. Watching the movie, especially when they were doing the um, when they were going to do the operation scene, might be me stretching, but it gave me Face Off vibes. I don't know if you've watched Face Off. Um, you know, I, I, I've definitely. I mean, I've seen it 
once quite some time ago like i'm very bad on movies that i should have like known oh, no, inside no, out back to back just uh, being super extra because i love face off and so when they were doing the whole like transplant moving over it just reminded me of like who would actually do this to themselves and put themselves in this uh situation of leaving themselves so vulnerable and bare but obviously yeah I, th- I think that sort of body horror thing is definitely you know there's mm. definitely similarities and sort of illusions in that situation i think some of that bit's quite gross as well when he sort of just cuts the top of his head off and just slaps it in the, <laughs> the scars. it's just like that's why i think uh jordan peele was so clever in terms of he waited until the really extra gruesome bits and really made you feel a bit like oh squirmish like it wasn't consistent i hate it when it's like so much blood and gore and it, you become desensitized mm-hmm. to watching it and then you just whereas this it was like little bits of moments that you were like oh that's yeah yeah just like <laughs> yeah i wonder how i'd watch that bit if i didn't have if i hadn't been exposed to medical <laughs> procedures in yes. i guess that level of depth i feel like you would be more well equipped to understand you know just look at it more of a medical it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah, just a, it's a bucket of stuff <laughs> <laughs> whereas i'm like ah it's awful one thing at the time that kind of came out was uh samuel l jackson's criticism of using daniel kaluuya and not using an african-american actor for the role that he wouldn't be able to draw from like the real american experience um as a british actor i have my personal feelings about this i wanted to ask you about yours i mean certainly it's a conversation that can be had um and I think I could easily swing both ways in the sort of sides of the argument is that ultimately I do up to a point agree with people who are being portrayed, being allowed to represent themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think in the broader argument, as much as possible, you know, where you're sort of, for example, portraying things like, you know, trans roles, et cetera, having Mm -hmm. trans acts and that kind of thing is certainly important. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I would probably argue that at that level, it's probably not practical and not reasonable to be like, you can't, unless you are a black person from black America, it's like, how far are you going to subdivide that? It's like, yeah. oh, you know, this guy's a black American actor, but they're from the North of the country mm. and we're portraying this in the South of the country. Should we yeah. have only black Southern actors playing that? I mean, ultimately Daniel Kaluuya is a black guy who Mm -hmm. is living in a, you know, predominantly, you know, a white majority numerically society and within white supremacy and has probably mixed with, uh, particularly being an actor, Mm. lots of white people saying quite crazy (laughs) shit to him at different, (laughs) crazy stuff to him at different times. I think he's arguably lived enough of that experience. And this film is, I'd say more global than just us. Yes. I exactly. think in this particular instance, I'm mm-hmm. fine with Daniel Kaluuya playing. I'm, I mean, I I'm totally fine, of course, with it. And also it's a made up character. It's a made up story. It's not even like it's based on a real mm. uh, historic figure. So I feel like Jordan Peele should be allowed to cast whoever he wants to. And it's a little bit hypocritical because if we're going to do that, then, you know, when Will Smith played the Nigerian doctor in concussion, it's yeah. like, I didn't hear you say anything about that. Um, and it's yeah. it's just a bit double standard. Yeah, I mean. completely. And it's unworkable and mm. yeah, completely a double standard and an odd person to fixate on. You know, if it were someone yeah. further along in their career. Yeah, exactly. Sort of, you know, might find have that conversation with them, but mm-hmm. don't when someone is emerging as, yeah. you know, a new person, don't taint a their experience of this. Like you know, can you imagine like can you imagine being Daniel Kaluuya? Who, and it's like the icon that sounds exactly. Like you're just thinking, oh my god, that's the work, the last thing you want someone like him to say about you. And mm-hmm. instead Amazing. of focusing on your performance or how you know well the film is or whatever, you're just kind of like, you shouldn't have done it. Like you shouldn't have given it to him. Like how mean? I just think that's really mean for yeah. someone. And, and Samuel Jackson's in a lot of films as well. Like think how many films he's then ruined for Daniel Kaluuya. <laughs> like Daniel Kaluuya is just gonna be like. What can I watch? Like, you, <laughs> you know, Samuel L. Jackson pops up everywhere. So you'd be watching a film, do. trying to get immersed, and it's like, fuck, is that guy again? I can't do it. He hates can't me. Like, I can't. I would like to see if they did have a little conversation at some point because mm-hmm. and just squash, squash the beef. And I yeah, hope Samuel guys. <clears throat> yeah, and like I can say it's not like I can't see the argument from no, Sam Jackson's side, but I'm mm-hmm. just not sure it's enough, and you know, the right time or place to. Yes. 
And I feel like as a community, we already have a, enough going against us that we don't need to add that to ourselves. Like I just felt it was very bad timing on mm. Samuel Jackson's part. And there's some great scenes in there. One of my favorite scenes has to be when um, Rose is on the phone to his best mate. Oh and, yeah. Like cold, like dead. It's completely like, yeah. And she's like having, uh, like trying to act all worried and whatever, saying like she can't, you know, she hasn't seen Chris and whatnot. Um, I just found that very chilling. Like, I know it's not a big part in the movie, but I just found her acting skills <laughs> really shone in that scene where yeah. she's not, there's no expression, but her sound, she sounds like there is expression. If that oh, makes completely. Sense. And like acting, someone acting. Yes. It's like next level acting. <laughs> Next level acting, yes. yeah. Exactly. If you can pretend to be someone who is coldly pretending to be worried, yeah, that is, you know. Did you have any favorite scenes that? Stood oh, any, out to you? any favorite scenes? I mean, anything with Lil Rel in it. Like, I mean, the comic. Really? I was thinking, obviously, being a comedian, the comic, like the bit where um, the female detective brings in the other two <laughs> guys, and it's like, don't tell me I don't do nothing for you. <laughs> It was just, you think at this point, okay, she's got the cavalry and they're going to... Yeah, go. and exactly, you think it's just going to be this thing and it's just, nope. No, we're, we're laughing at you. Um, mm. Even him, he played, like, his role wasn't humongous in the movie, but he executed that so well. And But now I just see him as that guy. Everywhere. Oh, of course, you can't, yeah. He's going to be jumping off the screen as that yeah. thing. Um, the bit I find interesting as well is, I'm sure everyone knows about the fact it had a different ending. And yes, we were going to touch upon Oh, fine, we're going to touch on that later, fine. No, but no, yeah, no, I mean, let's go that in, that, that as being, you know, that's mem- almost, I can't watch that scene without thinking about the alternative ending because I don't think, from what I remember when I first saw the film, I don't think I knew that there, what the ending was or anything and that yeah. there were two endings. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I thought almost the worst. I thought, given the time I thought it was because I understand that the other ending is not as dramatic as what as I thought was going to happen so I thought he was just going to get shot yes yes and that's what I assumed was going to happen he was either going to die or just get arrested and, yeah you know, the reality of what would really happen in real mm. life was yeah happen. exactly um, and I think the really good bit of that is where you see how conditioned she is mm. um, because you see her face light up yeah. When just even before you see that the police are there, like it's almost like a complete calm comes across her face because she's like, yeah, oh, I'm, f- hey. I'm fine. The police are here. <laughs> like this only goes one way from this point onwards is the look that she gets across her face. Yeah. It's crazy because my heart literally sank when I saw the sirens mm-hmm. and I saw mm-hmm. the flashing lights, which is crazy because like you said, for her, it was a, it was a relief. And for me, it was like, oh, here we go. It was a here we go again. Yeah, exactly. And that's obviously says a huge amount about a many, you know, a number of different things. Obviously, it's about her response to it, but also us as an audience, <laughs> where it's so normal that we understand that that interaction is not going to go well for him, despite him having done nothing wrong. Literally, yeah. And it's so funny because when I watched the the alternate ending, I was so heartbroken, and I was just like, oh my god, like I could feel the anguish, the pain, the hurt. And his friend is like, no, it's fine. We're going to fight. And he was just like, I'm done. Like, we've mm. been here. It's an old, you know, story of this time. So is that on the DVD? Or um, I said they're like an old man, like people still buy DVDs. <laughs> but, you know, how does, how does one, how does, how does, <laughs> what I mean is, how does one view this alternative? Oh, no, you can just go online. Yeah. You just go online, YouTube, but YouTube. Okay. Have you not seen the alternate ending? I've not seen the alternate ending, full stop. It's, uh, it really reflects the reality of... Of what would actually potentially happen. Yeah. Yeah. And no wonder why they were like, I think, you know, when they showed it to yeah. the audience and they're like, no, this no, we can, yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. This is, you know, we need some escapism and some semblance <laughs> some of hope. Escapism. Yeah. And I think that's why I love Jordan Peele. Like he hits home with all the, like the harrowing stuff that goes on, but masks it in some sort of humor mm-hmm. that you're able to digest it, even with us. And I don't know if you've seen Lovecraft country. Um, I'm you- meaning to watch it. The slight problem is, so, you know, like you have, uh, kind of you meet in the middle with your partner as to what you yeah. are and aren't willing to watch and like my certain partner she doesn't like anything scary it's, it's not scary as such it's more sci-fi fantasy drama okay. yeah i think she's not that bothered by that either <laughs> so you know it's, 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 it's on the maybe a, list yeah, yeah uh but, but it's, it's not scary so you can tell so, so if, she, if she watches it and gets scared she can blame you she can blame me okay. i mean now I feel the pressure. No, I'm joking. It's like, fine. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take the hit. It's fine. <laughs> okay. Like even in that, once you see it, it's very, it's, it's a 
period kind of uh, series, but so it's got a lot of like real racial tension and say mm. the 60s, I want to say 50s, 60s. Um, but again, there's all this fantasy, sci-fi, a bit of humour, um, black celebration mm-hmm. in all of it as well. Um, there's a lot of yeah. weird racist stuff in lots yeah. of sci-fi stuff and fantasy. Yeah. So like, you know, in Lord of the Rings, yes, um, oh, a lot of the really evil... Awesome. I know, I'm really sorry. Um <laughs> So this one's a bit more vague, but you can definitely read this as being quite racist. But like one of the armies of the, you know, the East and the, uh, yes. you know, the people who are helping uh, the, the bad guys, they recruit all these suave men. Right. Which I think has been read by quite a lot of people as people of a slightly darker complexion. And sort of like looking like they're certainly not from Europe, at least, I think is <laughs> the vibe people have said they might have been going for. Okay. So that sort I mean, of thing. I, I have... I have to draw the line at some point. Otherwise, I'm just never going to watch anything. Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, you can't. Com- yeah. And I think as long as you kind of go into it with kind of the knowledge and go, right, I'm going to compartmentalize this a little bit. Yeah. You can't have everything completely taken away from you. Yeah. Because uh, otherwise, uh, I'm like, can someone create a spreadsheet so I know exactly what <laughs> I need to avoid and uh, watch, basically? Well, um, I think that's a good app. I think you've just come up with. <laughs> A multi-million dollar making app, like the the, the racism spreadsheet. It's like, <laughs> what, what, you know, what it's we going to cancelled? Yeah, yeah. Okay. What are we going to go and see this weekend? I'm afraid uh, that restaurant is cancelled. <laughs> so uh, honestly, like it got to the point, and I was like, who who do I who am I supposed to? I don't know anymore. It's a uh, it's a lot. I think sometimes not everyone needs to be cancelled. Some people are just dumb. Yeah. Some people need a, I mean, obviously relativism isn't necessarily always the best thing, but sometimes to get through the day, you probably do need it at times. One million percent. And Um, just for your own sake as well, just so that you don't constantly walk around with your head exploding. Yeah. Which is how I feel, especially this year. I'm like, I don't know if I can take any more. I'm just Mm -hmm. kind of done with the... uh, I mean, but one thing I guess pointing out, going back to sort of talking about all of these issues is going back to the things that might bring up in oneself is mm. that when you do see films about racism and racism, you do end up looking back at yourself and going, am I really doing enough to be, you know, <laughs> he's, you know, saying this, this and this is bad. What are you actually doing to mm. try and combat those things? And how are you interacting with white culture without excluding black culture or mm. putting one thing on a pedestal and, you know, not celebrating other things because I think that was quite an interesting tension in it is that mm. it's certainly something I feel certainly is that if you spend a lot of time in white spaces and the things you are aspiring to are things that are currently done by quite a lot of white people how mm. do you engage with those things without at least conveying the idea that you're treating your own culture or at least black culture as yes. lesser and I think that's something this film made me think about quite a lot and so how have you been able to combat that um, I think it's a daily struggle because I mean, you, yeah. you know, because obviously when you watch a film or when you have a conversation about these things, you can be very stark and clear about those things, but then you go back to living your life and it's far more of a subconscious thing. You're having to constantly. So, and I guess the way of doing it and the way you have to try and actively do those things is well, how can you actively try and encourage other black people to occupy mm-hmm. those spaces and that sort of thing. And I think it's one of those things I would consciously say I up to it, unless you think about it, don't do enough of we mm-hmm. have to keep going back and go well no you have to try harder and yeah. do those things I kind of say like I am the protest <laughs> that's mm. my that's my line because yeah. uh, you just I think you can only do there's a lot of pressure especially like I feel this year there's been a lot of like you didn't put up this picture and you didn't put up this post and you didn't do this and it's like whoa 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 everyone's protesting in their own way like or mm. doing something to kind of help the culture or move the culture forward or whatever it might be so I just think us being on each other like that is not helping mm. well, no of course um, but I'm not saying it not even necessarily in an antagonistic way but if it can make you have like an honest conversation with yourself oh, not yeah, in a sort of yeah. like self-vilifying way but actually go oh, yeah. okay fine well actually there's a very easy practical step I can take in this particular place yeah and just you know having acknowledged the thing go okay well we can change that yeah no 100% and I think uh, a a few people kind of bury their head in the sand and uh, kind of act like it doesn't exist it's not happening well it's not happening to me so I'm okay Um, Mm -hmm. and that can be quite dangerous yes of course completely (laughs) one of my favourite lines in the film is uh, get the keys rolls when they're uh, when they're trying to get out yeah that gets really sort of the, the progressive angst uh, yeah. he goes where's the keys where's the keys where's the keys 
get the keys from <laughs> She's like, and when she switches and just goes, you know, I can't give you the keys. Oh my God. I was just like, even though I watch it like quite a few times, each time I'm so angry. Like mm. I'm so angry with her. I'm angry with him. Like why he did a clock on a bit sooner. Obviously it's hard. You're in there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we've I, seen all of the, the weird creepy shit. Yes, his, exactly. you know. <laughs> um, the testament of what a great movie get out is make the audience wrestle with the massive elephant in the room. Like, mm. you know, the race elephant in the room and, you know, put a mirror up and make you look at yourself mm-hmm. and reflection and stuff. And also that black does sell. I think that was the other point that this yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, did and that I feel like we obviously have to keep proving with that. If you had to choose a scene in the movie to direct people who hadn't seen get out, what scene would it be and why? Oh, I don't know. Like, I mean, it depends which aspect of it I was trying to sell them. So the bit <laughs> where you were like, if you ever wanted to have a sort of summing up of nice but still slightly racist interactions it's the <laughs> meet when he's walking around the house for the like he's there for the first time and he's talking about voting for Obama the third time then yeah. showing him the picture of his father competing against Jesse Owens yeah uh, that sort of thing like I think that is just perfect even when you take the horror out of it like there's that other kind of just awkward horror of <laughs> Like, that's the scariest bit of the film is that like that but nice awkwardness yeah know, the, um, i would so, agree that intro scene is definitely well with the parents and yeah, stuff so. meeting the parents is definitely yeah. the party more of the same of yes. uh, just having this sort of whirlwind of people just saying slightly weird off color stuff to you mm-hmm. it's like so did you just literally squeeze my bicep or, yeah or, i've actually had someone come up and touch me like that Oh, completely. Um, and the other thing was as well, I can't, I can't even think if this was in the film or if it just gave me flashbacks, but where people are <laughs> obsessed or cause I'm, you, you forget which bit of stuff you're listening to or watching. In fact, I think this is from something else that I've been reading recently but where yeah. people are obsessed with telling you how attractive your kids are going to be because Ooh. of, Oh, that is a, uh, you know, when you're in like a sort of mixed relationship or something, that kind of thing is certainly. I have had white guys say we'll, we'll make beautiful babies specifically because they're, then they'll be mixed and then, you know, and it's like. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I guess you have the worst thing of guys being terrible and racist simultaneously, is which so is an extra awful. layer. So I can only commiserate. Having, it, it's quite tragic. It's like, oh, if only you just kept your mouth closed, it would uh, help mm. you a lot more. <laughs> yeah. Which scene would you go for then? I would go for the, um, those two scenes that you did mention are, one of my favorites, but also the sunken place, you know, when mm. she kind of, you know, is doing the yeah. thing. I mean, I was, I, as a tea lover, this was quite terrifying. Oh yeah. So it just completely tainted like, it for. I'm now looking at, don't mix a spoon around me because um, I will be terrified. But yeah, that kind of scene, it was really chilling and it just encompassed the whole being in the sunken place. And I was like, ah, oh, that's where Kanye is. I see. Like, <laughs> makes you think makes Kanye's in the in the sunken oh, place Who, the who's you holding think? the teacup then <laughs> well that's a conversation for another yeah. day because <laughs> I mean I think it's funny you brought up Kanye though because there was a period before before did whatever else happened to Kanye happened to Kanye <laughs> but like I do have still quite a lot of affection for Kanye because going back to talking about the fact that definitely growing up it was very mono themed what black guys could be in mainstream culture and then yeah. Kanye at least in our era was certainly one of the few people to really go mainstream with I wear polo Ralph uh, you yeah. know uh, my mum although I mask it a tiny bit was you know a professor at university I'm yeah. not a drug dealer that kind of thing <laughs> you know yeah, it's like part it's of the f- to not fit into this stereotype and yeah. to wear a backpack and polo shirts and look a bit nerdy you mm-hmm. definitely made, which saying look a bit nerdy just because you're not wearing baggy pants and looking mm-hmm. a certain way. Um, but yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think that's one mm-hmm. of the reasons why I fell in love with that Kanye because I was Yeah, like, completely. Oh, just like, I, oh. I get this. Yeah, I get this. These are, there are these type, you know. Yeah. Many, yeah. Yeah, and obviously you've had people perform so obviously De La Soul and that kind of thing. Oh and yeah. There's a heritage of doing those things, but definitely of my era, and particularly yeah. I feel like cocaine rap had really taken hold. Like <laughs> Jeezy was uh, you know, <laughs> big and that kind of thing at the time. Like, yeah. well, you know, Coke rap is definitely like was the only thing you could talk about. We've had, you know, other conscious rappers before mm-hmm. him, but I think he just yeah, but no one wanted to listen to that in the club. Into the mainstream. Yeah, and like all they were doing a bit of both. They were doing a yeah. bit of just rap and a bit of yeah. Rap. But like but, I, but yeah, that's definitely that's the case. But I think Kanye was definitely the first 
conscious or at least conscious adjacent rapper who regardless of what they were talking about you could put on at a party and people wouldn't instantly throw things yeah. at you I think that's like, why it's even more disappointing that's this yeah, is oh completely I, I, it hurts I, more <laughs> oh completely it's <laughs> and I do think you know obviously some things he still comes out with it might be good but you just can't overlook like I, the, yeah. the MAGA and everything and I think once he put on that hat for me and look, little Wayne's obviously on that. that. That was such a weird time to go MAGA. It's like, why go now when? <laughs> the thing is, little Wayne's been on the chopping blocks for me for a minute um, as a black woman. There's things he's said, and I just can't forgive. So that oh, was like the cherry on the top for me. I was like, yeah, it's a, it's a fish. Like, you're yeah. not even cancelled. You're just, I'm not even paying any mind to you. Yeah. And I think obviously the thing about little Wayne, I guess, as well, is being so bound in not being able to release music has made him at least less prominent and relevant mm. in my mind anyway because it's like oh, Lil Wayne's got a song has he good has he where <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> is yeah. it buried still because he can't release an album and say so... exactly Jordan Peele won the Oscar yeah I was it brought me so much joy and gave me so much hope because it was like he wrote it directed it and it was just a masterpiece and I just think it kind of gave hope yeah. You know, talking about what you're doing for your part. And I think that's him kind of giving the next generation like a bit of hope. Oh, completely. Probably. Like and the only um, thing I think about though is it's going to sound ridiculous given how successful and brilliant he is. It makes mm-hmm. you feel uh, bad for Key. Oh, yeah, it's a bit orcs, isn't it? Because I mean, he does amazing things and he's in loads of great stuff, but he's still not Jordan <laughs> Which is really interesting because obviously I knew them together as the duo, yeah. and I, ne- I would have never thought that that person could create something like this, which is really bad because it's but, like, why are you but, limiting someone's, you know? Attention? But it is all there in the TV show, though, as well. Like, think about how like cinematic Key and Peel is, you know? Yeah. If they're making a sketch about zombies, it looks like a zombie film. Yeah, yeah. I know, but I just still like the way he approaches like hard hitting issues, especially mm. in America. Like it's just for me, I don't know, maybe it's cause it's aligned with how I like to digest things. I'm like, mm. you know, it's not a slavery film, you know? I no, exactly. Yeah. There's no more trauma in that respect. It's yeah. actually fine. It's a traumatic thing, but it's modern. It's a story that is under told yes. and is through, you know, it's subtext and metaphor. It's not literally, this is what happens. Exactly. This and is a can, horror film. But. Yeah. And it fits in with today and it's relatable and you're just like, yeah, literally that happened to me yesterday or mm. someone said that to me yesterday mm. or whatever it might be. So that's why I'm a huge fan. Um, but Matt, I guess me and you can speak about all things. <laughs> Jordan yeah, this is true. Yeah, completely. Yeah, this is yeah, again. It's the third podcast we're pitching. It's just talking about Jordan Peele for indefinitely. And I'd, I'd love to have you on yeah. to talk about. Um, you know, he's got Candyman. Looking forward to that. What other film actually in interest would you have chosen if it wasn't Get Out? Um, yeah, I mean, that is a really good question. So I did think about Boys in the Hood mm-hmm. was definitely one of the options. And then I think, so I mean, Friday had already been taken. So, and then... Oh, yeah. Um, Friday was taken and then selfishly was added on to Rush Hour as well. Oh, I know we kind of touched on... Just upon doubled up. Exactly. It's just like... We didn't, even, we didn't go too much into it because um, Rush Hour is my movie, but yeah. Because I mean, I don't know whether I'd fully classify that as a black film, but at the same, like... It's I more mean, black cinema than black film. Black cinema, okay. Yes. So we can celebrate Christopher. Yeah, exactly. Not his stand-up, from what I hear. I've not watched it, but I've heard it's... The, the one he did, like, a few years ago. Yeah, I've heard it's... <laughs> it's all right, but it's, it's, not, it's not Rush Hour. It's not Rush Hour. It was all right, though. Like, yeah, it's all right. Yeah. yeah. That's not what I mean. When I, if I ever get, if I am ever honoured with uh, <laughs> releasing a special, if the response from the world is, yeah, it's all right, <laughs> like, I will be disappointed. This is me being super PC because I love yeah. this. Uh, of course, yeah. And, oh, Matt, it's been an absolute pleasure having oh, you. This has been great. No, thanks very much. Um, it's been nice. You've made me laugh, my cheeks hurt. And, oh, uh, thanks very much. No, it's great. And I'd love to come back, obviously. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Get your hands on a gym and tonic G&T box. Enter the promo code BLACKINK for an exclusive 10% discount on your order. Gym and tonic. Sustainable urban gin.